Hello everyone and welcome back to Game Brigade. I am Brian Greer and on this show we do reviews, previews, playthroughs and have conversations on our favorite board games. So if you're new here, please consider hitting that subscribe button and joining the Game Brigade community. Today in the show we are taking a look at Whistle Mountain by Brezier Games. This is a review that I've been looking forward to doing so let's dive right in. Whistle Mountain is played with two to four players and takes about 90 minutes. You'll assemble the game board and place it in the middle of the table. Place three random small machines face up and the rest in a stack face down. Place three random medium machines face up and the rest in a stack face down. Place the three random large machines face up and the rest in a stack face down. You'll place the two water bar holders in the slots and stack all eight water bars below the first row of the grid. You'll shuffle the cards and place the deck face down on the card draw pile. Place three random upgrades face up and the rest in a stack face down. Stack the scaffolds on the scaffolding spots. Place one random award face up on each other level of the tower and place the rest of the rewards face down near the game board. Stack one of your workers on each level of the barracks and then place your other two workers in the whirlpool. Starting with the last player, take a number of starting abilities equal to the number of players plus one, keep one, and then pass the remainder of the starting abilities to the right. Each player takes one coal, one iron, one gold, and one water. Refer to the player book for player count for additional resources given to each player. Okay, welcome to Whistle Mountain. Uh, first off, I have been looking forward to doing this review uh, ever since late 2020 when this game was popping up on a lot of people's top 10 lists for the year of 2020. I said, you know, that's a game I need to take a look at and uh, did not disappoint. This game is a worker placement game but uses more abstract thought and thinking uh, in terms of how you are going to be placing your workers. And in fact, it uses an entirely new mechanic where you are going to be actually building the places where your workers will be going rather than having just purely uh, like predetermined pre locations. Um, also, I want to hear some feedback of what you guys thought of like the setup tutorial in the beginning of this video. I have uh, been playing with the idea of maybe doing like how to set it up so people can understand maybe the time take, how long it takes or how to get the board set up. Let me know in the comment section of what you guys think of that. I would love to get some feedback. Uh, of course, with all of our reviews, we will do a quick rundown of how the game plays so you have an understanding of the mechanics of the game, and then I'll break it down into my final thoughts where we talk about the art, the gameplay, the replayability, uh, overall thoughts as well. So let's dive into how this game plays. So this is a worker placement game, but instead of using your standard worker meeples that everyone is so used to using, you're actually going to be using these airships, these blimps and and uh, hot air balloons to be placing them on the board. Now I have set this board up to be somewhat early game where places have already been set with the scaffolding. Um, as the game goes, this will be building up along this board uh, and there will also be machines and different types of things for us to be interacting with and comboing as the game goes on. But what we're gonna do is there are uh, two different actions that you can take. You either have the forge action or the collect action. The collect action is the uh, main one we're gonna talk about first and then we'll talk about forging next. So with the collect action, you will take one of your three different types of hot air balloons and you're going to place them either on the edge of the board, so one of these locations here on the board edge, or somewhere on the grid. 
Now, if you place it on the edge, that was where you would be purchasing um, a machine, or you'll be buying more of these scaffolding tiles, or you'll be purchasing upgraded uh, components for your, your workers, or be getting cards or rescuing your uh, lost workers down here. So that is standard. You would just take your, your unit, you place it on the side of the board, you pay whatever the resource amount is, and then you would gain whatever it is over here. Some of them don't have a resource amount. For example, the upgrade machines don't have an up, uh, a resource count because the, depending on the upgrade you're purchasing, they are unique and so they have their individual costs on them. But if you don't want to place a worker onto the edge of the board, your other option is to place your, your piece somewhere on the grid. So right now, we have our grid locations here with the scaffolding locations, but there are no machines. So there's only one legal movement that we can do right now. And that would be placing our blimp or whatever somewhere along the grid and whatever we are adjacent to, we will collect those resources. So for example, if I placed it here, I would collect the steel and a whistle. If I placed this long blimp here, I would collect two steel, a gold and another steel. So your placement will matter depending on where you're gonna go. And this really comes into also playing into blocking. The more players that you have into this game, uh, so this can be played up to four players, uh, the more you're going to be considering blocking your opponent. For example, maybe going right there, uh, and you'll be collecting two, uh, one steel, one steel, and one, go and one coal, which will make that someone who has a blimp, or a, whatever this thing is called, won't be able to place there, because obviously you've blocked it. Now they could place their own uh, little blimp here and collect that, but it's just the different types of ideas in terms of blocking. I mean, you could do something like this, um, and it unfortunately will only get you one resource, but it is an idea in terms of how to lock down the board placement. Now this, you can only place up front in the beginning of the game on the grid. You cannot place your, your workers, your blimp workers on the scaffolding. So anything you're adjacent to will, will trigger. Later in the game, you're going to be getting these machines. Now, these machines are purchased and they're going to be placing on scaffolding. And the ruling for this is that wherever you place it, they have to be uh, fully finished on the bottom. The scaffolding has to be completely built. So when you do that, instead of having to place only on the scaffolding which or on the grid, which you can do, you are now able to also place it on the machine, which will trigger the machine and anything adjacent. For example, if I place it here, I would trigger the library ability, and then I would then also collect two gold. So that is the idea of how you are going to be triggering. Now, let's say, for example, there was another small machine down here. I could place here, trigger the library, and trigger the small machine as well. There's a lot of different combinations that will occur, and with the amount of different types of machines in this game, with the amount of different types of abilities, as well as upgrades, there, the combination is almost endless in terms of the amount of different situations or interactions you can complete. So that is in terms of the standard placing your ships in terms of the collect phase. But then there's the more complicated forge phase. So let's talk about that. Okay, so the forging action is uh, kind of be the meat of like the more complicated aspects of this game. So when you begin the forge action, everything is told on your player board of what you're gonna do. So if any of your ships are on the player board, the forge action first says return all of your workers back to your player board and return them to their docks. So we'll do that. And then if you had any uh, of these scaffoldings here, let's say I just had two, I can then place them onto the player board. So in any order, you're able to do one of the four items. So you have a build, you got another build, but it costs a water, you have another build that costs a water, or you can return your workers from the lost zone here, you can save them, or you can spend some gold to place one here somewhere onto the scaffolding. So we'll talk about that first. Let's talk about what that means. So here you have your location of your workers, plus you have some in the, in the pool, the whirlpool down here in the bottom. These guys have been swept away. If they are remaining swept away by the end of the game, these are each worth minus five points. So there is an incentive for you to rescue these workers and to, to get them out of there. You also have these guys which are awaiting your command to basically be working, but they're not that valuable in terms of what they do. 
So if you were to, say, spend one gold and you can move one from here, you'll take one and you'll place them into an open area somewhere on the scaffolding. Now, if someone were then to place a building, any player were to place a machine covering your worker, he will then follow the grid across to wherever the, the, the section is mattering here on the ladder, take a reward if there's one applicable, and then he is done for the rest of the game. Now, the where he remains at the end of the game is worth how many points he's worth. So obviously there's an incentive to try to get your workers placed higher up the board, but there are also other machines or contraptions that can send these guys up the track as well. So it's not, uh, he's not stuck here forever. Now you also have the ability uh, to some of these smaller guys can come across and get these ones that will not automatically rescue your workers because these are actually rewards that you can spend to get whatever benefit is on there. You have four of them down here that recover your lost workers, but this scaffolding section or this uh, tiered section is worth zero points. So those are how these workers work. Um, there is a point in the game though where there's this danger line where the game will be automatically advancing. When you build a machine, let's say for example our scaffolding was super high and we built a machine above that danger line, this water line will start to grow. Any workers covered by this water line will be automatically swept away by the, the rising turrent, currents and sent down here. Also, if you have machines built and they are covered by that rising water, they are now no longer effective because they are now waterlogged. You know, effectively the parts of the machine are underwater. And it means any part of that machine uh, being covered by water is now ineffective. And then when the, when the game will end, when the water has reached the maximum line. Going back to the forge phase though, we have the most complicated part. And I say that complicated because it's more of an abstract thinking uh, part of the game instead of complicated. So when you do your build phase, your forging phase, you have these Tetris-like pieces that you have to place on the board. And you can place them wherever you want. Um, you just have to consider uh, the locations of the resources that are listed on there, as well as what is your game plan for placing future construction, say uh, your, your buildings, your machines, and also not allowing your opponent to take advantage of your, your construction. There was many times in the game where uh, we saw people building because they had plans of placing, say, one of these large machines. Uh, and then an opponent will come in and build a small machine right in the middle of it and just throw everything off. So what you would do is if you take that order, you would place one of these somewhere on the board, uh, anywhere that's an open track, and you could place it anywhere, really, up top. So if someone wanted to do something like that, which now opens up above the water line, and then someone could then build a small machine here and begin the water track moving up. There are a lot of different ways to build the scaffolding, um, and really it's up to the players to decide how they want to place them. Um, and I say the most complicated part because this is more of an abstract thinking. Uh, you'll be starting to get in your own head as you're starting to plan out your strategies, thinking about what you're gonna do. And the fact that all of the machines have such drastically different abilities that uh, sometimes it can be hard to account for every situation remembering whatever machine can do I mean it's obviously possible if someone has played enough and they know all the machines it's obviously noticeable that you can know what everything is doing but being able to remember that yes this is what they do um, and what possibly situations could happen are there so that is the rundown of how the game is played you're going to be placing your airships on the board you're going to be trying to rescue these workers to get them across while also taking them up as high as they possibly can go into the build path over there. You're going to be upgrading your workers, your, your board with these uh, machines. And what I love about this is how cleanly they fit right into your player board. So you can have your player board fully stocked with different types of upgrades to change how you want to go. And then you're going to be returning all of your workers back as you complete more of the contraption, building more scaffolding, and uh, getting more parts going. It's a complete point salad. Resources in the beginning are going to seem like they're going to be extremely difficult to get. But as you start going and going, you're going to realize that it's a, it's a resource salad. So much stuff is happening. Tons of combinations are occurring. And uh, it's honestly a lot of fun. So let's get into my final thoughts and break down Whistle Mountain. 
So first we're going to talk about the components and art of Whistle Mountain. Uh, first off, the art to me was really great, especially this backboard for the actual player board. I really liked its icon, the no, iconography, I don't want to say that. I really liked its actual design. I felt like it reminded me of the Rocky Mountains. I live in the Rocky Mountains, so this was really fun for me. Uh, it's kind of drab in terms of colors. Yes, it's got a lot of browns and yellows. Um, and some in hints of greens, but it felt like it fit in terms of the idea that we are, you know, building uh, contraptions and machines in like the mid 1800s. To me, that's kind of where I saw this game being placed, and, and I really enjoyed that aspect. Now, the art on the actual engineering machines here is pretty bland, but that's because they're more focusing on the gameplay aspects of the iconography than actual art. So there are aspects of this game where the art is great and, and it's really good looking. Otherwise, I would say it's kind of bland and drab. Um, what I really think is the greatest part about this is the overall aesthetic. As you're building up your machines, as you're going up along the board, you've got this Tetris piece of scaffolding going everywhere. The uh, the design is really unique looking and I haven't had many board games that are just this much fun to look at. Uh, the components as well are very high quality. I like the wooden meeples. The resources that they come with, the five different types of resources, are all excellent quality. You've got really good looking stuff. Uh, it almost it looks like it came as a deluxe edition, as a standard edition. The card cardboard is very thick, so everything is going to feel very high quality. The only thing that doesn't feel as high quality might be the playing cards, um, but they're standard. Um, nothing too shocking there. The thing I want to talk about though with the art is the iconography. They have a lot of different pictures here to let you know what the specific item does. Um, but many times throughout the game, we were having to reference the rule book to find out what they are. Now, the great thing about this game is that every item is listed in the rule book of what it does. So you'll have the name of the machine, what it does, and what it does when it's activated. Everything in the game is listed here for different medium machines and small machines, upgrades, everything. So I do appreciate that they are trying to lessen the burden of what the iconography means, but there is a lot to look at. And sometimes you look at it and you're like, um, no idea what this means. And so let's now use that as a segue to the rules. So segue into the rules, finishing with the iconography, iconography, that word is so hard for me sometimes. Uh, there was a lot of stuff going on. Uh, I do appreciate that the rules back here in states like starting abilities, card references, breaks down everything that you need to know. Um, but it was very intimidating for us to play. Uh, and we were basically passing around the rule book the entire game. You know, you're passing it here. Okay, I need to read something. Okay, you pass it back. I need to read something. This game desperately is asking for reference cards of some sort that players can have in front of them so they can reference what machines do without having to constantly pass the rule book up and, and opening different pages. The rule book also, in my opinion, is written well. I just found that there were times where we had to constantly be referencing specific rules or situations over and over. I wouldn't say that this is a complicated game or that it's a poorly written rule book. I just think that it, the way the rule book is made, because they're trying to line it out as cleanly as they can, it's going to take at least one or two games for you to feel fully comfortable with what it's trying to do, as well as understanding what the pictures on all the machines are also trying to tell you. Overall, Whistle Mountain did not disappoint. I went into this game pretty hyped up with everything I've heard about this game in terms of the top 20 or top 10 list from 2020. And so I thought, okay, people are talking about how great this is. I like abstract thinking games, which require me to think of different ways to place the board. So let's give this a shot. And I will tell you the game didn't disappoint. One of the designers, Luke, also made uh, or worked on Dwellings of Eldervale. So I was very excited to see that one of the designers uh, was already working on a game that I've already loved. And uh, again, everything about the actual feel of this game was incredibly enjoyable. I would say that this game has a medium complexity, mostly because of the contraptions and the um, scaffolding play. I don't think the actual gameplay is difficult, 
but there are a lot of moving pieces uh, in this game. With the machines, you've got your abilities, and you have to place your different uh, locations. And as I said earlier in the review, when you have more players, I played this game at three players, but if you get up to four, I can't even imagine how many different, you know, right now you only got one color, but having a bunch of different blimps everywhere will definitely change your placement and how you want to play. And there were times where I would have an airship and thought to myself, you know, maybe I don't want to place a, a, something on the board right now. Maybe I'll recall early because then it's going to change up the first player order. So those are thoughts that came to my mind um, that I really enjoyed and it really did throw off the game because people get into a, com you know, a comfort zone of knowing, okay, they're going to be done and then they're going to recall, which means I get to do this. So by recalling early, by not placing your stuff, you can take your stuff off the board do change the board aspect which throws everyone off in terms of what they're planning to do and then when they recall you're going to have a completely free board to place wherever you want to collect resources i like those kind of interactive uh options definitely very very fun for me there uh things that uh, i didn't really care for was that some of the machines felt somewhat samey at times now they're all relatively good, but there are some machines that like this one uh, will give you one victory point or a medal depending on where you're at on it, where they, very similar to this one, gives you a water and a victory point. They're not terribly exciting. The best ones obviously are these big machines, but these big machines, they're so difficult to get them on the board because of the way players are gonna try to stop you from doing it because these are massive points. Once you place this, you get 16 points, uh, for, or this one gets you 12. Um, players are going to do whatever they can to try to prevent you from placing those, those machines. Or they're going to try to make sure they gum them up with a bunch of their own workers so that you are scoring them more points and stuff uh, if you do decide to score them. Um, definitely a lot of options. Now, I have kind of been leering away from uh, a scoring of this game. Um, but if people were curious of if I were to keep this in my collection, uh, definitely I'm keeping this in my collection. This is definitely one that I feel uh, will fit into a lot of different game nights. And I think a lot of different types of aspects of gamers would enjoy this one. Um, <laughs> I really want to give it a score. Um, maybe this would be my last score. If I were to give this a score, I was already debating in my head between like an 8.1 or a 7.9 because it's really on that borderline of like, this needs to be in your collection or I enjoy it in my collection. So the eight scoring, if I put something in the eights, I really feel like, yes, this has gotta be in your collection, something really enjoyable. Um, but I do think 7.9 is a fair score for this one. I don't think it necessarily has to be in everyone's collection, but I definitely think it's a game everyone should at least try. Uh, if not, if you have it in your collection, I doubt you're going to uh, dislike this game. A lot of fun, would highly recommend it. Can't wait to get this to the board some more often. Um, and that's it. So this was my review of Whistle Mountain. If you guys enjoyed this review, please let me know in the comment section down below. And the best thing that you can do is please hit that like button to show the YouTube algorithm that this is content that you enjoy. Not only that, it also puts a smile on my heart because I get to know that you guys enjoy my content. Again, I thank you guys for watching the show. I will talk to you all very soon. Yeah.